Okay, almost there. I can hear everybody. Thank you. And uh, all right, Brian, it's over to you. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Tonight's class, as you can see, is entitled Pathways, Guiding Others to Christ. And when you think about the society in which we live, we really do live in a society of preparedness, don't we? From a young age, we're counseled on the importance of planning for the future. From the time that we begin work, we start planning for the time when we will stop work, start planning for retirement. After all, it's important to be financially prepared for the later stages of life. Throughout our lives, various insurance plans are made available to us so that we can be prepared for the unexpected. Health insurance, car insurance, home insurance, life insurance, the list goes on. They all come at a price, but the hope is that it's less than the price of being unprepared when the unexpected occurs. As we think about the end of life, preparedness is found in how we capture our wishes and living wills, living trusts, last will and testament documents, and so on. We want those who remain to know our desires and our instructions for how it is that they should carry on without us. We don't want to leave them guessing or leave it up to chance as to how it is that things will proceed. Because that's the responsible thing to do, right? You can find numerous resources to help us with this. Websites, checklists, companies are all dedicated to providing us the tools that we need to make sure that we're prepared. It's good to plan ahead. It's good to be prepared. But do we show that same level of preparedness when it comes to things that are eternal? Think about the analogous spiritual examples to the end of life documents that I've just mentioned. What are the spiritual artifacts that we're leaving behind for those who will be left behind, those who will remain after we're gone? Think about the return of Christ for a moment. We believe that those who are alive and remain will be called away to be with the Lord, that the saints will be called away to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what that means for you personally, for your brothers and sisters. Now think about what that means for those who have not yet made a commitment, but who will be alive and remain when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, those who are left behind. Think about neighbors, coworkers, family who didn't lear, learn the truth when we did. What will happen with them? Have we adequately prepared them for the time of trouble that's coming on the earth? A couple of months ago, Chad and Martha emailed me about giving a class on this very topic. What does scripture say about preparing pathways for those that will be left behind, to lead them to Jesus, to prepare them to accept him when he returns, when the saints, when we are taken away and they remain. What can we say and do now that will help them then? Well, the topic was intriguing at multiple levels. It's true that we spend a significant amount of time and there is a significant emphasis on preparing self and others for the future. End of life planning is a significant part of that, preparing others for how to continue in our absence. But what does this look like spiritually? Is there biblical precedent for this type of a topic? Well, I began thinking about the biblical principles and the biblical examples that were relevant. I tried to think, how could such a situation actually exist? Presumably, we're talking about a scenario where we've had a discussion with someone and we've shared something about the scriptures but it hasn't really led to a commitment on the part of the other individual. So where does that put them in relation to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Will they be taken? Will they be left behind? Are they subject to the judgment or will they have another opportunity at the return of Christ? Well, we know the principle of responsibility, that those who are responsible will be raised if they are asleep when Jesus returns and called away to judgment. 
And we know that the responsible are those who know the revealed will of God and who are called upon to submit to it. Those who are not responsible will not be called away to judgment. They will be left behind to face the calamities on the earth. So if we've had a conversation with someone about the scriptures, does that make them responsible? What if we've had two conversations, five, ten conversations? What level of knowledge is actually needed? And how can we tell if God has actually called them? Will informing our neighbors of our beliefs now make them responsible to the judgment seat? And as I started going down this pathway in my own mind, I found that it was important to just pause and take a step back and to draw a distinction between the principle of responsibility and then our ability to definitively apply that principle to specific individuals. We can all nod our heads that those who God deems responsible will stand before Jesus at the judgment. Scripture is very clear on this point, but Scripture is also very clear that it is God who is the judge, and that it is God who calls. Romans 14 and Romans 9 are two great chapters covering the topic. Therefore, being able to agree to the principle of responsibility shouldn't be confused with an ability to then judge who is responsible. That's not really our job. Our job is to preach the word, and this is what we ought to concern ourselves with. Yet we may find ourselves frustrated when people don't respond. We may feel pressure to make them get it. What could we say that would just help them to get it, that they can see it? What will be the last piece of that jigsaw puzzle to where the picture will reveal itself and it will make sense to them? But what if they don't see it? Is there any hope? We don't know the limits of God's grace and God's mercy. We do know that terrible things are coming on the earth, and they're linked to the destruction at the times of Noah. Phrases like, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So yes, there are terrible things coming on the earth, but we also know that not everyone on the earth who's left will be destroyed. Because we are told that there will be some that remain after the judgments. Zechariah, for example, chapter 14, tells us in verse 16, as you probably know from looking at the minor prophets, that everyone that is left after the judgments of Armageddon, everyone that remains of all the nations, will be given the opportunity to come to Jerusalem and worship. There's the Midheaven Proclamation that comes up in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, of where the decree goes out to the whole world to submit to Christ, to submit to the King that's in Jerusalem. So there will be an opportunity for some. We just don't ultimately know who specifically will remain. So what does the Bible say about those that remain? Well, by and large, they'll reject the calling. The very next verse after Revelation 14 and verse 7, when the Midheaven Proclamation goes out to the world, is in verse 8, which speaks about the destruction of Babylon the Great, the great religious system that has confused and deceived the nations for centuries of time because they lead the people astray, lead them to reject the king that's in Jerusalem. Psalm 2 is specifically about that time period of the world rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns and establishes the kingdom. So how do we frame up the actual problem statement of what it is that we're trying to answer together? Well, we know when we take a look at the information that Jesus is returning to the earth soon. Time is running out. And that creates for us a sense of urgency because terrible things are coming on the earth, as we've already seen from 2 Peter chapter 3. And we desire for those around us to understand and accept the gospel before his return. But we're faced with the challenge at times that some simply can't get it. They don't see it at the present time for whatever reason. And there will be some who remain after Armageddon and have the opportunity to submit to Christ, as we've seen in Zechariah and Revelation 14. So if this is the challenge that's presented to us, what is the opportunity 
as we talk to those around us, as we try to prepare them for what lay ahead. The opportunity is what can we do now to prepare those who remain to make the right choice at that time if God's grace and mercy enables them to have that opportunity. It's important to say at the outset that there are some that are out of scope for this discussion, this class topic, and there are some that are in scope. The individuals that would be out of scope or the classification of individuals would be the enlightened rejector. Somebody who knows the revealed will of God has been called upon to submit to it and has rejected the gospel message. We can't specifically pinpoint who those people are, but we know that those who are responsible to the judgment will be raised. And there's numerous references that you can see here on the screen of where Jesus speaks about that. We know as well that this wouldn't apply to the believers, those who have accepted Christ and have been baptized, both the faithful and the unfaithful. They too will appear at the judgment seat of Christ, as we can see from Matthew 25, Romans 14, verse 10, and 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. The people that are in scope are the individuals with an incomplete knowledge and understanding of the revealed scriptures. That's the group of people that we're talking about. I thought it was important at the outset just to frame up the problem, the opportunity, and to talk about who is it specifically from a, a group standpoint that we're talking about. So the next question that came to mind then was, are there examples of this in scripture, of where this type of methodology is used, of where something's coming in the future, somebody's not quite understanding what's coming, but bits and pieces are provided to help those individuals so that when the time comes, they'll be able to see it. They'll be able to put the pieces together and take the right steps forward. Some of the examples that came to mind, and I'm sure you can think of some, would be Jeremiah. Jeremiah 27, verses 1 through 11, of where Jeremiah tells the people, look, the king of Babylon is coming down. And Babylon is actually going to overtake the nation. It's not going to be like other times where God delivers the nation. You need to make sure that when that occurs, that you submit yourself in service to him. And if you do that, then you'll remain in the land. If you fight against God's plan, then you're going to be destroyed. This was very different than their expectations. And they showed this by the way that they treated Jeremiah. They didn't accept the message. At least in the large part, they didn't. There were some who were faithful that actually listened. Jesus Christ used this method when speaking to others at his time, both the disciples and others who were willing to listen. The Olivet Prophecy is a perfect example of that in Luke 21, verses 20 to 21, where he tells them about what's going to happen in AD 70, at least for a portion of the Olivet Prophecy. And he says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. In other words, when you see this sign occur, when you see the armies circling Jerusalem, that's your time to get out. And so he gives them things to look for that they would not be able to confuse with anything else and tells them, here's the action that you need to take when you see that occur. Jesus did this very specifically with his disciples as well. And that's really where I want to spend a bit of time trying to understand the specific way in which Jesus taught his disciples to see what is it then that we can extract for ourselves and how it is that we talk to others about what it is that's actually going to occur. The principle here is found in John 13 and verse 19. Jesus is speaking to his disciples just before he's going to be betrayed. And he says in John 13 and verse 19, now I tell you before it come, that when it come to pass, you may believe that I am he. They didn't get it at the time. But he's telling them ahead of time so that when those things occur, it will trigger in their mind. Yes, this is what Jesus told us. And they'll be able to see the truth of it and respond accordingly. He says as much in John 16 and verse 4, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. Jesus was planting seeds that he knew would only bear fruit later. He was planting seeds now in anticipation 
of harvesting the fruit at a later point in time. Think about some of the specific ways in which Jesus did this. Because when I started to go through and see, well, how did Jesus do this? What were the things that he talked about? All the things that Jesus could tell his disciples. What were the things that he keyed in on? Well, Jesus talked to his disciples about things that were different than their expectations. And two big things that were different than their expectations was the crucifixion. Messiah was supposed to come and deliver the nation, to cast off the shackles of the Romans, and to establish the kingdom on the earth, to fulfill the promises that were made to Abraham. That's what Messiah was supposed to do in the Jewish mind. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12 that this is what the prophets of old sought to understand. They didn't really get that Messiah had to suffer and then be glorified after the suffering. This concept of a crucified Messiah was just not part of their expectations. It wasn't part of their plan. And so Jesus spends a fair amount of time talking about that to help prepare them for the reality of that occurring. The second piece is the rejection by the religious elite, the religious rulers of the day. The leaders who were professing to look for the Messiah would actually be the ones rejecting him. So when the, the Jews were looking, when the disciples were looking for direction, Jesus was trying to communicate to them that you really don't want to be looking at the leaders of the religious community of the day because they're actually going to mislead you. They're the ones that are actually going to reject me. And so some verses of where Jesus does this are found in Matthew 16, verses 21 to 22. And I've just made red the, the words that speak to the crucifixion, and in purple, the ones that speak to the religious rejection. He says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. The underline shows that it wasn't in alignment with the disciples' expectations. And so as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, way up in the north of the land of Israel, telling them, look, these are the things that are going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. The religious leaders are going to be the ones behind it. Peter says, not so. These things are not going to happen. And Jesus has to rebuke Peter because Peter doesn't understand what it is that's going to take place. Jesus tells them again, Luke 9, verses 44 to 45. He says, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. They simply didn't understand at the time, but that didn't stop Jesus from sharing with them these things that were different than their expectations. Some other references that come up in this same vein is when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, in John 3 and verse 14. He tells them that, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 8 and verse 28, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. John 12, verses 32 to 34, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And so you can see time and time again, Jesus is speaking to them about things that were not expected, things that they needed to prepare for. And he's trying to get them ready so that when these things occur, they would be able to put the pieces together. That seems to be the first category of things that Jesus shared to try to prepare to create pathways that would lead back to him. The second category was things that were irrefutable. The irrefutable sign that Jesus continued to bring up was that of the resurrection, that Messiah would rise from the dead on the third day. When this occurred, it would be an irrefutable sign that would prove the veracity of his messiahship. 
And he wanted to make it very clear ahead of time so that when it occurred, people would be able to see the truth of what he had been saying all along. Matthew 12, verses 38 to 40. They say, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 16 and verse 21. From that day forth, or from that time forth, rather, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. There's always that peace about the resurrection, that death, that crucifixion, that rejection by the religious leaders was not the end, but there would be the glory that would follow. Mark 9 and verse 31, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise again the third day. There's other references that we can look at, but suffice it to say, it's repeated over and over and over again. These categories of preparation, things that were different than their expectations, primarily in the crucifixion and the religious rejection, rejection by the religious leaders, and second, the irrefutable sign of the resurrection. Jesus expected that they would be able to put these things together. He expected or expressed this expectation before the crucifixion. He says in John 14, verses 25 and 26, that he expected that they would be able to put these pieces together, that they would be able to see the picture, but it would take some help for them to be able to see it. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So from this, we can extract that it was important that the disciples first heard the message. How could they remember something that they never heard? So it's important that we actually do talk to others so that the message is in their mind, that it's there somewhere in the resource recesses of their mind, that they're able to recall it. Second is that the Holy Spirit would need to act on them in a manner that would allow them to truly get it. They would need some help putting the pieces together. And at that point, they'd be able to remember what Jesus had told them and understand the significance of it. That was before the crucifixion that Jesus expressed this. After the crucifixion, Jesus enacted it. And Jesus worked with individuals at the time. We can see this on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, verses 25 and 26. Cleopas and his wife are trying to reconcile what it is that's taken place. Jesus, unbeknownst to them, is the one talking with them, helping them understand, asking them questions, and in the process of doing so, revealing to them what it is that had actually transpired. And at the end of it, he says, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The suffering first, the glory that would follow. They should have been able to get it. The reality is they didn't. Jesus had to help them put the pieces together afterward. The disciples in Jerusalem, the very same chapter, Luke 24, verses 44 to 46. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. See, Jesus made a point to tell the disciples all these things before while he was yet alive. And Jesus, in similar manner, had to help his disciples put the pieces together to really be able to see the picture. So we asked the question, will it be required for the saints to open the understanding of some who simply couldn't see it before? It's an interesting question to think through. We actually find that these aspects that Jesus had used with the disciples are the very same tools, the very same approach that the apostles then used in the Acts of the Apostles to now preach to the multitudes and to help them get it. 
in the same way that Jesus helped his disciples get it, was the same way that they would then use in their preaching to help other people put the pieces together. Let's take a look at a couple examples. The day of Pentecost was one of those. Think, think about what we were talking about, things that were different than expectations and the irrefutable sign of the resurrection. At the day of Pentecost, Peter is speaking to the multitude and he highlights the things that were different from their expectations to help them connect things that they couldn't connect before. He says in Acts 2, verses 22 to 23, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter's connecting the dots of the crucifixion and the rejection by those who had claimed to be looking for the Messiah. He follows on with the irrefutable sign that came after in Acts 2, verses 24 and 32. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witness. They'd all witness the empty tomb. It was irrefutable, the sign of the resurrection. What was the result? of being able to connect the dots between things that were different than expectations and an irrefutable sign, it was the conversion and baptism of 3,000 people. As we read in Acts 2 and verse 41, extremely powerful in the way that they were able to take what they had learned from Christ and apply it now in their own preaching. This was a consistent method that they used. Peter and John in the temple, Solomon's porch in Acts chapter 3, they used the same approach and obtained similar results. Things that were different than expectations, Acts 3, verses 13 to 15. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One, and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, the crucifixion of the Messiah, the rejection by the religious leaders. The irrefutable sign, the second half of Acts 3 and verse 15, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. An irrefutable sign and the result, the conversion of at least 5,000 people as we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. You can see at the bottom of the slide that other notable instances of this are found in Acts 4 verses 10 to 12. In Acts 5, verses 30 to 32, you can see a consistent pattern in the way that the apostles preached. And it may be that in God's mercy, some will survive through the events that are coming on the earth. Because as we fast forward from the days of the apostles to our day, we ask the question, what are the things in our day that are different than expectations and that are irrefutable? It's an interesting and helpful exercise to go through of trying to put this lens over the events surrounding the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to identify those events that are most compelling and would therefore be most helpful in creating pathways for those remaining to find Christ. But before we do so, I want to pause briefly to consider why is this important? Why is it so important for us to identify what is most meaningful? and most compelling for finding pathways to Christ. True, it may be a new way for us to look at the events surrounding the return of Christ, and we may find new things really interesting, but it really goes beyond interest or curiosity. If you turn over to Ezekiel 33 for a moment, you'll see a very important principle that caused me to pause and to consider rather deeply. In Ezekiel 33, we find the principle of the watchman in verses 1 through 11. And what we find summarized is the responsibility that's placed on the watchman. The watchman had a very important job. He was situated in an elevated position in the city, whether it was at a high place in the wall or in a tower. And they would watch diligently for impending danger. And they had the responsibility of sounding the alarm. When they saw danger coming in the distance, danger that nobody else could see yet, 
they were responsible for sounding the alarm and sharing with others what it was that they saw. There's a, a few things that are brought out in these verses. The principle of the watchman. There's three scenarios that come to the fore. The first scenario is listed here in verse 5b. That means the second half of verse 5. And in this case, the watchman does his job. He sounds the alarm and the people respond. And the result is great. The people live. The system works as intended. But God also speaks about different things that could occur, different scenarios. For example, in verses 3 through the first half of verse 5, we have the situation where the watchman sounds the alarm, but the people do not respond. The result is that the people die. So who's held responsible in that case? The watchman sounded the alarm. The people didn't respond. They die. Well, God says through his prophet that the people are responsible because they had the opportunity to respond and they simply didn't. They chose not to heed the warning. But there's another scenario, which is found in verse 6, of where the watchman sees something in the distance, but he doesn't sound the alarm. He sees impending danger. And because he never sounds the alarm, the people don't respond. And the result is that the people die. And God says in that scenario, you hold the watchman responsible. Because the watchman never gave the opportunity for the people to respond. The principle here of the watchman is that the watchman is responsible for giving people the opportunity to respond. He's not responsible for how the people decide to respond. So why does that matter to us? Well, each of us has been given the privilege of being able to see what is coming on this world. God has opened our eyes to the understanding of his word and the prophecies contained within it. And based on the principle of the watchman, we have a responsibility to share what we see with others, those who have not yet seen the danger that's coming. We have a responsibility to give others the opportunity to respond. What they decide to do with that opportunity is on them. But God is expecting that we share what we see. And if we take this analogy to its fullest extent, then we find that God will actually hold us responsible if we don't share. It's worth taking a moment in the quiet of our minds to think about the significance of this responsibility. God says that when the watchman doesn't sound the alarm, when he doesn't share what he sees with those around him, and they perish without opportunity, God says, their blood will I require at the watchman's hand. How much blood do we have on our hands, brothers and sisters? How many opportunities to share what we see have we passed by out of fear or inconvenience, lack of awareness, or simply lack of preparedness? I found this meditation to be particularly poignant for myself. It's not really something that we can choose to opt in or opt out of. If we apply this principle to ourselves, it's both our privilege and our duty to be our Lord's watchman. I found that this increased my level of interest, the intrigue of this topic, and increased the sense of urgency for me to really pay attention, to really think about how it applies in our lives. And so with the principle of the watchman in mind, what are the things that we would want to share? Of all the things that we see, of all the prophecies that we've read about, studied in the minor prophets, in the major prophets, of what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ reveals to us that will happen in the book of Revelation, and in the other books of the Bible, what are those nuggets that we might want to share that follow that same pattern of things that are different than the expectations of the masses and things that will be irrefutable when they occur? If you could only share two or three things, because that's all that the attention span or the opportunity would allow, what would you share? Well, when considering that question, let's think through and remind ourselves of some of the events that are going to happen surrounding the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you can see here, the first thing that will occur is that Christ returns. We have the resurrection, the judgment, and the rewards and the rejections issue. See some of the verses that help to support that. The next thing is that Russia moves into the south to destroy Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. 
We have some of the verses from Isaiah and Daniel 11 here. Next, we have the Western powers, the young lions that are surprised. And there's weak support that they provide in the Middle East. Christ and the saints, meanwhile, are in Sinai preparing. The marriage supper of the Lamb, that they're preparing for what's going to occur and getting ready for the battle of Armageddon. News from the north and the east, Trouble Gog, the king of the north, Russia. He moves over to the east, as we read in Daniel chapter 11. Meanwhile, Christ and the saints who are now glorified and immortalized heal and convert Egypt, as we read in a number of chapters in the prophecy of Isaiah. Gog, meanwhile, destroys Jerusalem. The city is taken captive, as we read in Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, and in Daniel chapter 11. But this is not the end for Jerusalem, because we know that Christ and the saints reveal themselves in Jerusalem. That there's a great earthquake as the feet of the Lord hit the Mount of Olives, splitting it in two, sending shockwaves throughout the earth. And Gog is overthrown, as we see graphically depicted for us in Zechariah chapter 14. Following that battle is a decree to all the nations to submit to Christ and to enable his righteous rule. The opportunity has come for them to submit their crowns, to lay them down, and to follow the example and the rulership of the Lord. So if we were to take a look at these events and try to put that lens of things that were different expectations and things that would be irrefutable when they occurred, a few things seem to pop out. And I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are as you think about this topic. One of the primary things that would be different than expectations is Russia moving into the South, destroying Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, and even Israel. You can see currently that Russia is fighting a proxy war down in Libya, that there's a battle taking place through third party military engagements between Turkey and Russia. There's already events taking place that are setting the stage for this to occur. But much of the world, at least the Western world, is distracted with other things. Coronavirus, election results, things on the home front that distract attention away from what's happening in the Middle East. An irrefutable sign that will occur is the great earthquake with the overthrow of Gog. It will be irrefutable because the whole earth will feel it. All the inhabitants of the earth will be shaking and there will be no arguing as to whether or not this earthquake is taking place. It's an irrefutable sign that will mark the appearance, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ to humanity and the overthrow of the Russian host. And third, a thing that's different than expectations and irrefutable will be the decree that goes out to all the nations to submit to Christ and to accept his rule. So let's take a look at these three things and then try to extract for ourselves some things that we could share with our interested friends, people that we come in contact with, to try to help prepare them for the things that lay ahead. So starting in first order with this aspect of things that are different than expectations, with Russia moving south to conquer Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, and Israel. We read in Daniel chapter 11 concerning these events. And at that time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Western powers are not going to expect it. We read in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13, Art thou come to take a spoil? Russia is supposed to be there for peacekeeping purposes. They're now the, the arbiter of peace in the Middle East, with the United States beginning to withdraw. And so the summary that we see is that the Russian Confederacy is the king of the North power. Russia is going to move south in successful military campaigns against Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, and Israel. And the Western powers will be surprised. It's going to be different than their expectations. 
The saints may or may not have already been taken away at this point. There's different thoughts concerning this. But when our interested friends see that these things are taking place in the Middle East, that should be a cue that things are happening that will usher in the Messiah. And this can help them to realize that the pieces that they've heard about before are actually occurring. Some people think, well, people have always been fighting in the Middle East. What's any different? This is going to be significant. It's not going to be expected. It's going to take many by surprise. But the Lord Jesus Christ won't be revealed yet to the world at large. We know that that happens when he appears at the Battle of Armageddon, Zechariah chapter 14. It's interesting to note how many different occurrences this earthquake has in Scripture. When you look at it prophetically, and I'm sorry that the text is a bit small on this particular slide, but there's just so many references that speak about this earthquake that it has to be one of those irrefutable things. Just look at some of the ways in which this earthquake is described. Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 5, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. This earthquake is so significant that Amos references it in his prophecy. It's likened to the earthquake that occurred in the days of Uzziah, significant for the nation as the earth quaked beneath them. Joel 3 and verse 16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The heavens and the earth shall shake. Think about an earthquake of such significant magnitude that it splits the Mount of Olives in two, changes the topography of the land of Israel, and is felt not just in Israel, but around the globe. In Isaiah 2 and verse 19, we read, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. When he ariseth to shake terribly the earth, it's repeated again in verse 21. Just imagine the unease of the earth continuing to shake beneath you and not stopping. Ezekiel 38 verses 19 and 20. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. This is going to be an earthquake of proportions that this world has not seen. It's going to be an irrefutable sign. And when that occurs and chaos ensues around those who remain on this earth, that should be a reminder, a trigger, that the Lord Jesus Christ has appeared to humanity. To not give up hope for those who are alive, for those who do remain, and by God's grace and mercy are given the opportunity, but to know that this is what has been predicted, that things are not completely out of control, but finally, things are beginning to get in control through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It won't be readily apparent to those who are experiencing the earth shaking continually beneath them, but it's a step in the direction of what it is that we know is going to occur. If somebody can have these pieces ahead of time, it will help that when these things occur, they can have the right understanding and interpret them in the right way. And finally, the decree to the nations to submit to Christ for those who do remain, as we read in Zechariah 14 and verse 16, that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up, upon them shall be no rain. They're going to experience famine. They're going to experience hardship if they don't submit to Christ. And clearly that's going to happen with some. 
Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, the mid-heaven proclamation. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. But the problem is that by and large, people won't accept it. Just imagine a decree going out to all the rulers of the earth, to those who are responsible for rulership in the United States, in the nations of Europe, in the nations around the globe, that, hey, there's a king in Jerusalem, and you need to submit your authority to him. You need to worship him and do what he says. How well do you think that's going to be received by the world powers of today? Well, Psalm 2 tells us. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. The result, though, is going to be that they are broken with a rod of iron. Those who remain will be given the opportunity to submit to Christ, but many will not submit and they'll be broken as a result. Why won't people submit? Well, it will be different than expectations. Patterns of history tend to repeat themselves. And just as the religious rulers at the time of Christ, the ones that claimed to be looking for Messiah, rejected the Messiah when he appeared at his first advent, so too the religious rulers of our day will reject Messiah when he appears the second time. We're told as much in Revelation but they'll gather themselves together against him to fight. One of the big reasons for that is what's shown on the slide. I'm not going to go through this slide now, but what you can see in the left column are the future events that will occur. In the middle column are different publications that talk about how these events are actually going to be the things that the Antichrist does when he appears. And you can see the references at the bottom right of this slide as to where those are pulled from. And I can't take credit for this. This was compiled by somebody else. But on the far right, you can see how these things, these different events, are actually predicted to be Jesus Christ from a scriptural standpoint. And so the rest of the world is going to be looking to some type of guidance, some type of leadership. What are we to do? And when people's lives are falling apart, where do they turn? Well, they turn to religion. They turn to God. And who knows better about God than the religious leaders? But when this king shows up in Jerusalem, claiming divine authority, there's an expectation that that's the Antichrist. And as a result, many who are looking for direction will be misled to fight against the very king, the very one who is the Messiah, who can actually fix and will fix the problems of this earth because they believe that he's the Antichrist. It's different than expectations. We want to make sure that others are prepared to not follow the masses at that time. So, in summary, what is it that we've taken a look at? What is it that we've thought about? Well, we need to prepare those around us for what's coming on the world. Jesus is returning soon to the earth. And we need to share the gospel to give others the opportunity to respond. Even if others cannot see it presently, our responsibility is to preach. And Jesus shared the information ahead of time so that the pieces would be connected later. Jesus shared things that were different than expectations, things that were irrefutable. Those things were the crucifixion the rejection by the religious leaders of the day, and the resurrection. In our day, when we look at the events that will happen around the return of Christ, we can see things that fall into those same categories, things that are different than expectations, and things that will be irrefutable. Russia coming down, conquering the areas of the Middle East, a giant earthquake that will reveal to the world that Christ has returned, and the command of the world to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the appeal to them to not reject Jesus, but to accept him. So what if we're wrong, though? 
What if a number of those who we're talking to now don't survive the events of Armageddon and the other calamities that happen at the return of Christ? Or what if God actually deems that those who we're talking with are responsible to the judgment seat of Christ? Does this mean that our consideration over the last hour has been in vain? I don't think so. As I mentioned before, it's very important for us to distinguish between understanding the principle of responsibility and then claiming to be able to identify who specifically is responsible. For example, we can understand how the Bible defines responsibility, knowledge of the revealed will of God and being called upon to submit to it. But it's God alone who has the authority to apply that definition definitively to individuals to assess the degree of responsibility. Whether or not an individual is responsible is not our concern. The watchman is concerned with sharing the message and sharing it clearly. It's the watchman's job to effectively sound the alarm. The sword of judgment is coming, but it's not the watchman who wields it. The watchman must focus on delivering the warning clearly. Someone else will deliver the judgment. It's not the watchman's concern. And over the last hour, we've focused on the warning and how it is that we might deliver it more clearly. We've considered the precedent in scripture of looking at those things that are both different than expectations and irrefutable. And the intent has been to clarify the warning and to increase our effectiveness in its delivery, to perhaps give us that bit of additional courage to have the conversation that we may have previously passed by or to give us the words that perhaps eluded us at the time of when we wanted to speak because we didn't know where to start. Where do you even start with a conversation? Hopefully this has helped to distill out a few things that would be helpful. Because if as a result, we're able to speak more clearly, more persuasively and more confidently about the things concerning the return of Christ, isn't that a success? If we're able to be more effective and more intentional in sounding the warning with those who we come in contact with, hasn't this been an hour well spent? And if we're able to impact just one more life because we've considered this topic together, then isn't that a reason for rejoicing? Regardless of how judgment is executed, we know that God will be righteous in how he delivers it, in his mercy and in his judgment. In the chapter of the watchman, God says in Ezekiel 33 and verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. It's our duty and our privilege to share the news about what's coming on the earth. So let's continue to share 